Hello, you're watching People's Dispatch and today we're going to be talking about the flooding in South Asia. Now, we've all read reports of the disastrous incidents of flooding in Pakistan, millions of people affected, over a thousand dead, huge issues of health, availability of food, etc. Pakistan is just one recent instance of a wave of similar incidents that have taken place across the South Asian region. So we have D. Raghunandan with us at the Delhi Science Forum and the All India People's Network, Science Network to talk about this. Raghu, thank you so much for joining us. So as we've seen a lot of uh, flooding and you know extreme weather events taking place in South Asia as a whole over the past many years, especially it's difficult to sort of bring all of this together under one umbrella because these are very diverse regions, very different weather conditions. But maybe could you take us through some of the patterns that we've seen in terms of these weather events and resultant flooding? Yeah, sure. Uh, as you say, uh, weather patterns can uh, vary according to several reasons. Uh, but we have seen, I think, some trends which have uh, shown to be quite consistent in the South Asian region particularly. Uh, and that's related to the monsoon. And uh, climate scientists and meteorologists today believe that you can do all manners of analyses and computer modeling to figure out why this trend is there. And they have come across no factor which is common to these trends other than climate change. Right. Uh, that climate change is the only phenomenon that, they, that can explain these events, this trend over this period of time. For instance, the last 10 to 15 years have witnessed abnormal monsoons. Monsoons have come early. They have tended to be, not in overall terms, the total amount of rainfall may have been plus minus 10%, but more than that, the precipitation, that is the rainfall, has been concentrated in just a few days. And this we have witnessed, as you know, in our country, in Bombay, in Chennai, in Hyderabad. Right now we are witnessing it in Bangalore, where almost one month's uh, quota, uh, if you like, of rainfall falls in a matter of one day or two days. Right. So you're getting rainfall of 200 millimeters, 300 millimeters, Last year in Thane, uh, just outside Mumbai, you had rainfall of 500 millimeters in just one day. And that exhausts almost a month and a half of uh, the rainfall quota. So these are what are classified by meteorologists as extreme rainfall events. Anything more than 200 millimeters is certainly classified as extreme rainfall. And we've seen those occurring repeatedly in the last 10 to 15 years. I can't think of any two years where this has not uh, occurred. Of course, there will be variations in region. Some years you will get this in Himachal, some years you will get this in Uttarakhand. You remember the uh, monster rainfall and glacier melt in the 2013 uh, Uttarakhand uh, uh, disaster which washed away uh, large parts of Kedarnath town, uh, etc. And as you uh, remarked, we've seen this in Nepal this year, in Bangladesh repeatedly uh, again, but there are variations. Uh, now, if you come to Pakistan specifically, and what we are seeing this year, it follows this pattern fairly closely with one added dimension which was also there in the other South Asian uh, events we spoke of. And that is, you had very high uh, temperatures and a prolonged heat wave in the months of April and May. Uh, temperatures exceeding 40 to 45 over a period of two to three weeks continuously. Parts of Pakistan reaching 50 degrees uh, Celsius. So very abnormal heat wave uh, conditions. And as you may imagine, when the warmer air in the atmosphere is there because of the heat wave, the air is getting hotter and hotter. It has greater potential to absorb moisture. Uh, 
So uh, when the moisture comes, it accumulates in very large quantities in the atmosphere. And therefore, when it starts raining, it doesn't rain, but it pours. Uh, because there's so much moisture waiting there. Uh, and when the precipitation starts, it just all comes down in a rush. So that was part of the phenomena this year uh, in Pakistan. And this kind of pattern, as I said, has now been associated with climate change. There is no other uh, phenomena. As you know, monsoons are modeled now using multiple parameters. You have supercomputers modeling the monsoons. And they have found that no other parameter explains this other than climate change. So we are now fairly confident that these phenomena are due to uh, climate change. In Pakistan in particular this year, as I said, there was a heat wave uh, that was followed by an early onset of the monsoon and by a low pressure uh, zone building up over the Arabian Sea which then moved northwards. And that then, this combination of these events put together resulted in this heavier uh, precipitation, huge amounts of rainfall. But added to the rainfall is two other factors. One is the high temperatures resulted in more melting of glaciers in the northern hills uh, of Pakistan. Uh, that was one additional factor. Several glacial lakes have also burst their uh, boundaries and the water has come rushing down. So all these have contributed to much heavier uh, water in the Indus River and its tributaries, which have then flown down uh, in Pakistan. Some local factors of Pakistan are also there. Most of the areas it has flown through are in Sindh, Baluchistan, uh, the plains areas where the waters are going to flow down to the Arabian uh, Sea. Pakistan does not have much by way of storage infrastructure, an extensive canal system. So when the Indus or the tributary rivers burst their banks, there is nowhere else for the water to go except in the fields and in the towns and cities and what you're witnessing in Pakistan today is, even though the rainfall has stopped, the water inundation continues because there's nowhere else for the water to go. One just has to slowly wait for the water to drain out into the Arabian Sea. Of course, this brings us to the question of uh, how equipped we are across the region of South Asia that is actually deal with such kind of events because we see uh, flooding affecting rural areas, of course, but we also see flooding affecting urban areas, some of the biggest cities in the region. So it looks like it doesn't look like anywhere we are prepared to actually deal with the impact of this. In urban areas, and as you rightly said, we have witnessed this every year: flooding in Mumbai, in Chennai, in many other cities. Delhi, not that much, but even in Delhi, a few drops of rain and the traffic is disrupted and. Uh, uh, there's water logging all over the place. The problem is our uh, the stormwater drainage system uh, that we have in India, in most cities, are just not designed for this kind of heavy precipitation. Like I said, you expect a certain quantity of rainfall spread over two months during the monsoon. Even that sometimes catches us by surprise and uh, it results in water logging. But if you get that much rainfall following in two days, then again, there's nowhere for the water to go. It goes into the drainage system and comes back into the thing. We are witnessing this in Bangalore uh, today. So in fact, we will have to invest a large amount of money in relaying a new drainage system in all our uh, cities because the drainage systems we have just cannot cope with this volume uh, of water. That's one. Second is we have got haphazard urban development taking place. Land in the cities is viewed just as real estate 
and the builder lobby just sees so many square meters on which they can build. They don't take cognizance of the fact that there are natural drainage lines leading from higher elevation parts of the city down to the river or sea or wherever the water drains out. Buildings come up in those natural drains, uh, blocking the drainage system, which means, again, the water has nowhere to go and stands uh, blocking it. In Bangalore, this year reports are that the more expensive high-rise uh, buildings are the ones that have suffered the most because they have been built without any reference to uh, urban planning, what uh, drainage there is in the city, etc. They just acquired a parcel of land and built uh, on it. There are people who have paid for it and those areas are suffering because the drainage is uh, uh, bad. And third, natural drainage, which most of our cities have, some river passing through it. Uh, in Mumbai, you have the Miti uh, River. In Delhi, you have the Najafgarh and other drains, which used to be uh, rivers once upon a time. In Chennai, you have the Kuam and the Adyar uh, rivers. All these rivers which would carry the water from the city into the ocean are now blocked by construction, by garbage, by overgrown uh, uh, overgrowth of all kinds of vegetation. So existing drains we have blocked up. Natural drainage lines we have blocked by uh, unplanned uh, uh, construction activities and even the stormwater drains that we have built are under capacity. Now, if all these things put together, it's not surprising that we are uh, facing these problems. But the important thing to realize is the longer we wait, the more it's going to cost us. I uh, fully recognize that this is an expensive business. Rain drainage lines is not an uh, easy task. It's not an, uh, cheap. It is expensive. But it's a one-time investment that's going to carry you through for the next 100 years. Uh, existing drainage has seen us through for 100 years uh, now. And the drainage we'll build now will see us through for the next 50 to 75 years at least. But the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost. If it is going to cost 20 crore per kilometer today, five years later, it's going to cost 100 crore per kilometer of drainage. Uh, so the longer you wait, the more money it's going to cost. So uh, the unfortunate part is in India, we've been dealing with climate negotiations, etc., and making our mitigation promises. We have completely forgotten about what are happening to climate impacts here uh, at home in our country. And we have not even started uh, taking preparations to build resilience to the climate impacts which are already hitting us. Right, Raghu, in that context also, of course, there's been a lot of talk about Pakistan as well, which contributes less than 1% of global carbon emissions, but has been identified as one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. We have seen similar situations in Afghanistan also. So for countries in this region, for instance, what really are some of the mitigation strategies? We know COP27 is also coming up. There'll be a lot of discussions on these issues as well. Yeah, so uh, like I said, in for each country will face its own unique problems. Uh, we in India have a very large peninsular area and we are facing coastal erosion in a, in a big way. Uh, many villages uh, have been washed off, particularly in Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, in Kerala. Uh, this is happening more and more frequently. We've seen the coasts uh, shrinking and the oceans moving in. Uh, latest computer uh, uh, models uh, have shown that by the year 2030, large parts of Mumbai, Chennai, Kochi, Puri, Kolkata uh, will be submerged under rising sea levels. As you know, even in Bombay, large parts of the city are built over reclaimed land. And they are at the same level as the sea. So if the sea rises by one foot, that's it. One foot of water is then permanently uh, covering your land. On top of which, you get high tide. 
and on top of which you will get storm surges if there are high winds, storms, typhoons, cyclones, uh, or whatever. So we are extremely vulnerable in terms of sea level rise. Uh, we have seen in our country the hill regions in the Himalayas, in Himachal and Uttarakhand. As it is, these are young and geologically unstable areas. So these extreme rainfall events precipitate uh, landslides, uh, rock slides, uh, which we have further compounded by using very bad techniques in road construction, in construction of bridges, infrastructure, hydroelectric projects, and even urban settlements in the hills far larger than the carrying capacity of those uh, areas. So if there is one episode of this nature, it's going to wash away a lot of this infrastructure as we saw last year uh, and two years ago with the uh, Tapovan hydroelectric uh, project and many parts of Srinagar city being uh, washed away uh, and so on. And then you have the Eastern Belt in Bengal and the Sundarbans, uh, which is affecting Bangladesh as well as India. Submergence has already started. Uh, there's all been almost a foot and a half of sea level rise in the Sundarbans. There is very simple mud bunds are being built uh, in the Sundarbans by the local people, which is not doing uh, very much and in fact may increase precipitate uh, overflow of the water into the villages and prevent drainage back into the drainage part. So these have to be scientifically worked out and designed apart from the fact that we are also destroying natural protective barriers like mangroves, etc., uh, in the region. And on, on top of that, uh, our government has compounded uh, these problems by reducing the coastal zone uh, regulation area. It used to be that you cannot construct within 100 meters of the coast. Now that's been reduced to 50 meters. That means we are exposing more areas to. So we are doing two things. We are uh, engaging in developmental activities which will worsen the climate impact when it hits us. Uh, we are removing natural protective barriers and we have not started taking any action to anticipate these problems and build resilience to this in whatever way uh, we can. Uh, some of these will call for innovative uh, solutions, which we should be looking for, doing pilot projects in different parts of the uh, country. We need to do that. So, in fact, Delhi Science Forum and the All India People Science Network has called for a national action plan on adaptation and climate resilience. It's time to launch that, like we have launched a program for reducing emissions on climate change, but we need to have a large uh, plan in India for adaptation and climate resilience, which should involve all stakeholders, particularly state governments, scientific institutions, civil society organizations, local self-government bodies, uh, etc., who can bring ideas, resources, problems, and solutions to the table and work them out in a cooperative spirit, but recognizing that money is still only with the central government. Uh, state governments don't have money, panchayats don't have money, nobody else has got money. So for the funds that you require, it requires active participation of the union government in these programs. Okay. And I guess also, this also brings to the, uh, to the fore, especially for smaller countries, the issue of climate financing as well, on which the global north has completely failed to deliver. Absolutely agreed. I'll just add a small rider. Uh, Pakistan today, the Pakistan Human Rights Commission today has spoken about uh, compensatory finances for the uh, disaster, loss and damage. Right. The issue of loss and damage with many developing countries have been raising in the international negotiations for law. However, I would like to express a word of caution on this. The developed countries as a whole have pledged $100 billion a year 
going back to the paris agreement going back to copenhagen and the world has not seen more than 10 billion dollars uh, out of this so you can add uh, reparations loss and damage adaptation mitigation funding you can keep demanding this ultimately it's a package of money which the developing countries have to give right. so i it doesn't really to me okay it's you're making a political point by saying pay reparations uh, pay for loss and damage see what you've done but ultimately it's the same kitty of money from which you're going to get the money we've not seen that kind of money flowing uh, yet and with what's happening in ukraine and russia billions of dollars have been pledged pledged by the western uh, countries for this war effort uh, against russia so that's less money that's available for anything uh, else here so although countries are demanding and rightly so uh, reparations uh, etc let's face the realities that there's a limited amount of you know, money that's there in the kitty and out of that the most vulnerable countries the countries with the least amount of resources should get first claim uh, on those funds thank you so much raghu for talking to us it's a very grim picture but it's also an issue we need to keep talking about raise awareness about thank you that's all we have time for today keep watching people's dispatch